So hello, um, my name is Manuel Heredia. I am the general manager of uh, Crisalio Mobility. And in the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna take you through a um, journey of the uh, past, the present, and potential future of uh, air mobility. And being fully aware that um, may be the last obstacle between some of you and your lunch. I'm just gonna try to keep it short, and uh, I'm gonna try to keep it a bit interesting, fun, so uh, maybe a little bit provocative at times. Um, so the first thing is, uh, uh, I feel I, I need to explain, explain what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a collection of uh, technologies that has been evolving quite rapidly in the past uh, few years. Uh, most of them related to digitalization, to automation and batteries. And at the end of the day, when, when applied to uh, um, air transportation, they are opening up new use cases and new types of aircraft. Uh, and new use cases that uh, conventional aircraft uh, were not able to serve uh, properly in the past. Um, first question uh, we can ask ourselves is whether we should take this sector seriously. And we all know that one of the first conditions in aviation to be taken seriously is to define a healthy amount of uh, acronyms to describe what you're doing. And I think at that respect, we're doing quite well. Um, here I'm just showing a very small subset of them. So this area is called Advanced Air Mobility, or AAM, in the US, with a very similar definition, but a different name. It's called Innovative Air Mobility in Europe. And a subset of both of them uh, is Urban Air Mobility, when you apply these new technologies, new use cases, specifically to urban settings. By the way, the gentleman I briefly introduced you before uh, will uh, come with us, uh, will you join us in this journey. His name is Norman Augustine. If you don't know him, I uh, thoroughly recommend that you uh, uh, get to know him. He's, um, he, he's a relevant figure uh, in, in the, the last century already. He played a role uh, both in industry and uh, regulator and also as a politician. And many of the things that I'm gonna tell you that have happened, are happening, and are, are likely to happen in, in air mobility were already predicted uh, around 70 years ago, as we will see in the next few slides. Um, a reflection as well. Why, why is it important, all these things that are happening? And um, let me introduce you, Javier Matallanos. He, he was my mentor. He's the person that 30 years ago uh, in, uh, welcomed uh, me when I joined uh, uh, the, the industry. And he used to uh, welcome all the new recruits uh, with the sentence uh, I, I quoted here. Congratulations. You're now in the most wonderful legal business in the world. And it's true that uh, during, during a long time, uh, during the beginning of aviation, it was a really cool place to be. Yeah, there was a lot of people who felt very proud to be in aviation. We got lost somehow in the last 20 years, and there's been perfectly healthy young individuals who have mistakenly chosen to go into different businesses like finance or the internet. Uh, but this is changing now, and it's changing thanks to this revolution of aviation that is making aviation great again. And it's not surprising. You know, what is not to love about flying cars. The promise we're making is that we are having, we're going to propose something that is, has the convenience of a helicopter, with no emissions, with very low noise, with less maintenance, because there will be simpler machines, and therefore a lower operating cost. Some of the predictions, uh, some of the estimates we make, is that the, the price ticket uh, for an equivalent route uh, with a helicopter could be as low as one-fourth of the price when we apply these new technologies. And again, you know, anybody said flying cars. This is, uh, I think, as child, uh, as children, this has been uh, in our imagination for, for a long time. And this has driven many entrepreneurs, many startups to go into this space. I have for you exclusively uh, some footage taken from outside the EASA offices uh, in Europe when the news uh, spread that there was these new technologies and these new opportunities. And here you can see uh, some of the uh, startups and some of these uh, entrepreneurs rushing to uh, bring new designs and uh, to get into the adventure of uh, certifying these new aircraft. Now, jokes aside, uh, going back to my friend uh, uh, Norman Augustine, he already predicted that. Uh, fools rush in where incumbents fear to tread. 
uh, we, can, we can see the result of this. Uh, this picture has been borrowed by the Reality Index, which is a popular uh, ranking of, uh, of projects. Uh, for the next joke, I'm going to leave dangerously because it's probably going to give away my age. But when I look at this picture, I always think inevitably about this one. Wacky Races from Hanna-Barbera was part of my childhood. And it, it really reminds me of what is happening in, in, in this new industry. Uh, in other words, in a more, you know, more serious, uh, perhaps, uh, way to, to express it, we're still far away from uh, the sort of consolidation of the architectures. There are many ideas, many proposals, uh, some of them very inspired. I'm going to make a bold attempt at classification, okay? And uh, here I hope uh, I will, uh, I'm asking for your forgiveness before I start with. And because I'm an engineer, I, I tend to, uh, to classify things in two axes. So on the vertical axis, I'm going to have, um, I'm going to classify things uh, around capability, you know, in a very uh, generous definition of the term capability. Uh, we said at the beginning, this makes sense because we are making new use cases uh, uh, viable that were not before uh, with, uh, with conventional aircraft. And on the horizontal axis, I'm going to classify along the level of disruptiveness of the proposal, of the architecture. Um, by the way, uh, this horizontal axis, you can also measure uh, or express it in the number of uh, or the distance a certifying officer would like to be away from this dossier. Yeah? The more strange the design, the more difficult to certify. So, again, a very personal classification, uh, which uh, for sure is open to discussion, but we have conventional designs fitted with electrical motors. To what extent are they adding new capability? Well, yes, you're reducing emissions, reducing noise, uh, but it's a, it's a limited proposal in terms of volume, okay? Multicopters uh, are adding uh, a number of capabilities, but they're very limited in range with the current uh, state of the art of batteries. Augmented lift could be a long discussion depending on which specific project you have in mind when you look at this category, so I will not go into that. Lift and cruise has a promise of a, of a relatively ease of certification uh, with certain uh, capabilities. Of course, you have the drag uh, in the literal sense of, uh, of, the, uh, of the lift uh, propellers that are, that are feathered during flight, reducing your efficiency. And vector thrust would be fantastic if we managed to certify it. But the number of challenges ahead are huge, okay? First of all, uh, we are thinking about flying light aircraft at a low altitude over densely populated areas and carrying heavy explosive batteries. So it's no, uh, no surprise that uh, uh, people may want to think twice about that. Especially for us, we are an industry obsessed with safety for good reason. And we want to keep it uh, this way we was, because we can, we can be proud of the safety record uh, and, and we can only sustain the safety record if we continue to be uh, extremely prudent about we, the way we move. There's a second element, air traffic management. If we imagine these hundreds of uh, vehicles over, over flying uh, cities, the current systems we have for air traffic management do not scale well. So we need to think about something different. And there are projects uh, uh, working on, on this in different places of the world, but they need time to mature. We need the physical infrastructure. Um, here, uh, one of the, the, the promises is that these uh, vehicles will be able to operate from vertiports. Now, vertiports are cheaper to build and easier to integrate in urban settings than uh, existing infrastructure but you need to build them. And this is probably one of the largest infrastructures undertaken of the humankind. And then there are many other elements that sometimes are not so visible, but they also pose uh, difficulties. I highlight here insurance. Insurance is critical for aviation, but insurance is an industry that is based on statistics. And uh, uh, asking insurers uh, to put a um, to put a price on an insurance of something without a track record is pushing them to a, a, an uncomfortable corner. And in dark, stark contrast with these challenges, we have big promises, very ambitious promises being made, especially around the 2020s, uh, beginning of the 2020s, uh, when there was this uh, exuberant period of uh, investment. Uh, with, uh, with people promising to enter into service already this year or next year, 
Uh, again, this was uh, anticipated by our friend uh, uh, Norman Augustine. He used to call this the conspiracy of hope. And it's something that for anybody who's been around the aviation industry for long enough, uh, is, you're probably familiar with this. Yeah? Anybody who needs to uh, get investment for a long, expensive project is under an extremely high pressure to promise things. And, uh, and then uh, we all know, uh, if we look beyond, beyond the advanced mobility, if you look at aviation uh, as, a, as a whole, we all know how uh, this can become a slippery slope very quickly. At the end of the day, we're talking about changing air transportation. This is comparable to the deep transformation uh, that humankind uh, over, over, over went with the advent of electricity, with the advent of cars, with the advent of uh, mobile phones. And, uh, and this is not a sprint, it's a long distance race. I've seen somebody compare it actually to, to a triathlon because you, you, you swim a long distance, uh, which would be the design phase, which is already quite challenging. When you think you're done, you start your certification process, which is again, uh, quite challenging. And when you just start off uh, breath, uh, then you need to start to scale up production, okay? So this is the challenge we have in front of us, and I'm only talking about aircraft manufacturers. Because paraphrasing a famous uh, American politician, it's the ecosystem, stupid. It's not about the aircraft. The same way uh, electric vehicles, or electric cars, it's not just about having a fantastic car. If your country, if your city does not have a dense network of chargers, you're very limited on what you can do with it. So here it's the same. You, you need an aircraft, but you need to put all the different pieces of the, of the puzzle in place. Uh, here we require the convergence of three very important elements. On one hand, you have the maturity of the technology. Then you have the acceptance of the public. And finally, you have the trust of the regulator. And these three things are very, very connected. It requires a holistic approach, and it requires a lot of cooperation between the different stakeholders. I have a friend who works for a competitor, and we normally joke together that we should think about cooking the cake before we discuss how we're going to share it. And we need to accept that beginnings will be difficult, more difficult than we think, and slower than we think. I bring two examples here. One uh, is the, uh, the famous uh, UK uh, Red Flag Act, uh, which some of you may, may be aware of, around the end of 19th century with the start of the automobile in the UK. They passed a set of laws to try to put some order and regulate how you could use an automobile. Uh, one of the requirements was as if you were driving your car in a city, you, must, you had to have a person walking in front of the car carrying a red flag to warn everybody there was a car behind, okay? You look at this from today's standpoint where cars are everywhere and we're so used to them and it is absurd. But it probably was a necessary step back then. By the way, it was a very short-lived regulation. The second photo, photograph is uh, a, one of the first mobile phones. A Motorola from 1948 took the space of the whole booth of the car. So you, you needed to have a car to carry the, the mobile phone. At that time, it was probably considered something very elite, something very cumbersome, not particularly useful. Again, for the people uh, living at that age, it was probably difficult to forecast that everybody will be carrying one or two mo mobile phones in their pockets with the power of the computer that took us uh, to the moon. So we need to think about this uh, when we project uh, what is going to happen and how fast it's going to happen into the future. But we definitely need to uh, follow an approach that takes all the steps into consideration and doesn't try to skip steps. So we need to crawl first then we will walk, then we will run, and eventually we will fly. And boy, we will fly. This is why I go back to our friend Augustine. Everybody likes to talk about the early bird. Nobody talks about the early worm. Yes, the early bird eats, gets a worm, but the early worm gets eaten. Again, my message is timing is of the essence, but that does not necessarily mean being first is the key. 
I'll give you another slide to motivate this. This information is public. Uh, it's taken from the Zerion database, where you can uh, take a, a cross look of uh, the backlog of orders uh, for advanced mobility. This is slightly outdated. This is from September 2023, so the figures may, may have changed, but not dramatically. Okay? There's a whopping 11,000 advanced mobility aircraft orders, which is a testimony for a huge appetite for this type of aircraft, okay? for these new solutions, these new use cases that are being enabled. But only 4% of them are binding orders. Another way of reading this is that 96% of these orders are up for grabs. So the game is very much still on. Well, uh, I was hesitating about uh, showing a, a quote uh, from Mr. Augustine that mixed uh, a chimpanzee and a uh, official, uh, regulation official, so I will not read it. It will be really uh, rude of me. Because in fact, as an actual fact, I feel huge respect for the role of regulators in this case. They really are laying the tracks of the train in front of the train. I mentioned before the hordes of cowboys yeah, proposing wacky racist designs. This is not so inaccurate description of what has been going on in the last few years. We are trying to push what accounts for really disruptive innovation through a process that has been perfected over many years to uh, certify incremental innovation. So all these, uh, all these new ideas, all these crazy ideas, there is no track record to support them. And this is making the job of regulators extremely difficult. And this is, by the way, creating opportunities for second movers. Uh, here I'm, I'm referring, for instance, to uh, the difficult situation of some of the pioneers who felt, uh, let's say, on a faux pas, uh, or caught uh, by a change in, or, or a definition in the regulation, uh, having to repurpose a project that was originally designed uh, thinking that it would be an uncrewed aircraft, and later had to make do with what they had, because they had already made some committing decisions. When you're moving behind, you're stepping to a certain extent on firm ground. The rules of the game are relatively clear, and you're able to make progress at a much uh, faster pace, making better use of resources. There is a struggle for harmonization, okay? I will not go into the detail of this slide. I think you're all familiar with the discussions between FAA and EASA. I still believe there is more that joins together FAA and EASA uh, than uh, elements that separate them. Because when we think about what is happening elsewhere, last year, China already certified an aircraft for autonomous operation, something that both uh, European and American agency have already stated they will not uh, go even near. Now, we need to pay close attention to this. The world is much bigger than just the US and Europe. For me, uh, today, these aircraft are operating inside China. The level of exposure or visibility we may have outside of China is maybe limited. But make no mistake, these aircraft will start operating outside of China. Uh, China has a strong foothold in uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And we will start to see these aircraft operating. And then I can see two scenarios opening. One scenario is that they can operate without any problem. Okay, and they, they can demonstrate that they are operating safely without any issues. And then we in the West have an issue. We have a problem because we, will, we have decided to uh, rule out this, uh, this, uh, uh, this option and we are running behind. The other alternative, the other scenario, is that they start operating and they have issues. They have safety issues. And then we in the West have a problem as well. Because we will need to be able to explain to the general public, to the investor community, that certified is not the same as certified. So whatever happens, we need to pay close attention to, uh, uh, and we need to keep in mind that the world is a bit bigger than just Europe and the US. For the last part of uh, my, sp my speech, I will try to make some predictions of what's going to happen uh, with all, all the usual caveats, okay? We can expect consolidation. I think this is uh, quite clear by now. 
there will be some consolidation. It is not. It does. It does make sense to have uh, over 300 projects uh, the same way. In the at time, it happened with the automobile industry. Later, with the, uh, the general aviation industry, it will happen again here as well. And this will change this, the level of, uh, of challenges that we are uh, having today. We have a challenge to find talent. This consolidation may change the job market as well. We need to expect standardization. It's already happening. Uh, let's say it's happening on a structured uh, format in, uh, in the different, uh, um, uh, uh, let's say, uh, structures and organizations that uh, take care of this, and it's also happened in a less friendly way. For instance, we have seen uh, the beginning of the connector wars or the charger wars uh, uh, also in, in uh, advanced aviation. It is still to be uh, known which one of the potential bottlenecks will be the one driving the speed of, uh, of adoption. Will it be the regulation, as some people claim? Will it be the availability of the infrastructure? Will it be the air traffic control? Where are we going to get the pilots for these 11,000 aircraft? We don't have pilots enough today just for the airliners. Um, will it be the maintenance structure? So the infrastructure we have today for maintenance is, uh, is thinking about large aircraft that can travel long distances for a, for a, you know, for a long, uh, um, um, let's say, for a um, stop, maintenance stop. But uh, probably the sort of infrastructure we need for this will be closer to what we have for cars, with uh, sm many small uh, multi-brand uh, uh, workshops uh, in, different, in different cities. With the implications these have as well for the job market. Insurance, uh, you name it, okay. Again, I want to uh, put uh, the, the emphasis on cooperation and, uh, and the fact that it makes sense uh, cooking the, case, the cake before we, we dis discuss about sharing it and my, my comment about uh, the world extending way beyond US and Europe. You're all familiar with the hype curve. I think we can all identify we passed the, the peak. Yeah? There was a peak around 2021, 2022. Investment was soaring. Uh, everything was uh, rosy, and there were many promises. We passed there. I would argue we've not uh, reached the, the, the bottom of the trough. I think we have in front of us still one or two years of difficulties because many of these ambitious, optimistic promises, we still need to see whether they, they, they are uh, they're, uh, they're materialized or not. So uh, let's say, let's say we, we still need to uh, keep working, be disciplined, because there will still uh, be some suffering in front of us. So if I want, I would like to conclude just by uh, highlighting a few uh, key takeaways uh, to finish on an on optimistic note, on a, uh, giving a bit of hope. I really believe we are in the most beautiful legal business in the world, especially now. Uh, it's all about the convergence of these three elements. It's about putting together maturity of technology, trust of the regulator, and acceptance of society. And we really are going to transform uh, the tra uh, transportation and transform our cities. This is a huge change. Um, it's a matter of when. It is no, more, no longer a, a, a discussion of whether is this is going to happen. It's a matter of when. Timing is of the essence. And again, it's not about being first. The Iron Man uh, of uh, advanced mobility is still very much on, and uh, still remains to be seen what will happen. And for further timeless wisdom about anything you want beyond uh, advanced mobility, aviation, or uh, anything in general, I refer you to The Laws of Augustine, which is uh, the book written by, by Norman Augustein, and I really recommend it. And let me conclude by uh, inviting you uh, to uh, get to know Chrysalium Mobility, my company. We have the booth uh, the, down the, the, the lane, uh, and there we can, uh, uh, if you are interested, uh, we would be very happy to share with you what we're doing and how we're contributing to this uh, revolution and to change the way the planet moves. And I will leave you with just a few seconds of video just to give you a flavor of uh, what we're doing.
Thank you very much.